So this guy has a problem. You see, there's an application that he can't delete off of his computer. He can't fight his curiosity anymore, so he decides to run the application and see what it's hiding. Upon opening up the application, he realizes that it's actually a game. And soon enough, he'll find out that he's not alone. Welcome back, my, um, soup family. Uh, today we're gonna be talking about the ARG Rapid Eyes. If you guys aren't familiar, I'm gonna give a brief summary really quick. It's a YouTube unfiction about a guy who, you guys probably figured this out by the intro already, but he, he opens up his computer and then there's this random application called Rapid Eyes. Um, it, it's on his desktop and no matter what he does, it just, it's not going anywhere. It's, it's here to stay, like an unwanted tenant. He obviously doesn't like this. It's it's um, it's not sitting right with him. And so like any other reasonable human being, instead of him doing the smart thing and you know setting his PC on fire and throwing it out the window, he decides to actually open up the application and play the game because that's exactly what it is. I gotta put on my chapstick for this one. <laughs> It's gonna be a long video. I'm gonna be flapping my lips a lot. So the first video on his channel, it opens up to his desktop screen. And again, he explains how he hasn't been able to get rid of this application. He's tried everything from resetting his operating system and then blah, 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 yada, yada. Can't get rid of it, right? So he, he goes ahead. <laughs> And he, he goes ahead and he, he opens up the application just to show us what's on it. And again, this is presented as his uh, fresh, raw reaction. So the game opens up to a home screen with a vast ocean. Uh, the main character plays the game and, you know, in the game there's just this long wooden pathway in the middle of the ocean. It honestly looks like something I would build in Minecraft on a bad mental health day. You know, with nothing else to do, nowhere else to go, and he's very puzzled the whole time. But regardless, he goes ahead and he um, starts walking down this path until he finds this, um, this, this um this wiggly tower it's it's just a tower that kind of kind of jiggles a little bit it's defying the laws of physics so you know, he makes note of this and you know the jiggliness of course how how could you not yeah that's about it for that first episode that that's all he finds you know so that's that's where the ARG ends guys so uh, thanks so much for watching don't forget to tune in next time where we uh talk about all of the regrettable life choices that i've made leading up to this moment just just kidding <laughs> that's not where that's not where it ends it gets worse trust me so episode two the main character decides to return to the game only this time it, it's much worse it's it's so much worse god it's so awful he uh he opens it up and instead of that little boardwalk thing he he finds that he's in a forest clearing at nighttime, of course. And then there's a purple, like, a uh, campfire in the center of everything. So it's just this trees all around and bam, there's, you know, a fire hazard right in the middle. It's already looking great. Now the main character comments on how this level is much more advanced than the last one. Clearly this was made in Unreal Engine, guys. This is, is state of the art. So the main character starts walking down one of the paths in the woods and he finds a note on one of the trees and it says the following. Do you know the difference between envy and jealousy? Well, no, I, I, I actually don't. I th thought they were both the same thing. <laughs> Aren't they both the same thing? Envy is when you want something that someone else has. This feeling buries itself deep inside you and will never let you rest until you attain that thing. Jealousy is when you feel threatened that something you have will be taken by someone else. Which do you have? Both. I, I have both. So the main character just misses this note, uh, expecting it to be something a bit creepier. What, main character, what are you, a, a redditor or something? Is that is that what it is? Are you a redditor? Do you use Reddit on a regular basis, at least more than twice a week? So the main character continues to walk forward into the woods, and then he reaches a fork in the road and finds another note on one of the trees. It says the following. You long for it, you envy it. The peace and tranquility of this place and that, but you'll never get it. Okay, so this note kind of answers, I guess, what the main character is supposed to have, which is envy. And if we go back to that note from earlier, where it was describing the difference between envy and jealousy, we find that, you know, envy, of course, is when you want something that someone else has, and this feeling buries itself deep inside you and will never let you rest until you attain that thing. This is implying that the main character, I guess, is wanting something that others, or maybe at least one person, has and he feels like he can't 
have that. I guess we'll get to learn a little bit more about that and what it's alluding to later on, but I just wanted to make note of it. So the main character, once again, he dismisses this second note stating that it wasn't very nice. And then he continues down the path in the woods. As he walks forward, he sees a light at the end of the path and hears an ominous droning noise. Now the main character is clearly unsettled by this, but he continues to walk anyways. At the end of the path, he finds a strange glowing orb, and then after approaching the orb, the game resets. And this is where episode two ends, and now we're going to move on to episode three. Now the main character finds himself back on the endless boardwalk in the ocean. He starts walking down the path and states that he believes something with the tower must have changed by now. Interesting intuition on his part. It almost seems like he's starting to predict some of the things that are happening here. So it's a little quick to be doing that, I feel like. That, that was something that I found interesting. You're only like about three episodes in and it's like he's already acting like he knows what's up. I will explain why I find that interesting as will the series, but just keep that in mind. Now finally he finds a tower and then he finds a note on the front of the tower. This is what it says. As above, so below. Pretty obvious what this means here. And you know, picking up on the memo, the main character jumps into the water and then this happens. What in? Oh yeah, okay, yep, mm-hmm. Yeah, no, 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 that makes sense. Yeah, 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 sure, sure. Okay, yep. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. You know what? I saw this coming. I was ready for this. Yeah, okay. Yep, just, just another fun day at the beach. <laughs> so after taking the leap, the note changes to so a bow, look, so a bow. So what, that's what it says, so above. So below as above. With nothing left to see, the main character starts walking back and then a droning sound can be heard. Um, he finds another glowing orb, of course, and after reaching the orb, the main character is teleported to a parking lot level. Now, while exploring the endless parking lot, the main character expresses that he feels like he's seen this specific parking lot before, haven't we all? You know, we all have that special parking lot somewhere, nestled deep within our hearts. I feel like everyone has a, a special parking lot. It's like an astrological sign, you know, you, you just can't not have one. I mean, for me personally, my parking lot is an Ikea parking lot. I've never I've never been to Ikea. With no clear direction as to where to go or what to do, the main character starts walking forward. He expresses how this level creeps him out more than the other ones. <laughs> now we're starting to piece together a few pieces of that puzzle here. You see this is where things start to now the main character finds a note on one of the traffic lights while he's walking and it says the following. No souls for miles and miles. The main character moves on and he states that he doesn't like this level due to how mysterious it is. He doesn't understand what the game is trying to tell him and that the lack of answers is bothering him. Um, he then starts to question why the game is even on his computer. He then states that he actually recognizes this specific parking lot with absolute certainty. Now the whole time the droning sound of wind blowing starts to play, which implies a certain sense of ominous dread. <laughs> you know, it's not too late to set that PC on fire, okay? It wasn't that expensive. We all know you bought it from Walmart. Throw it out the window. Get it, get it out of your house. So after expressing how much this level creeps him out, the main character runs into a stop sign in the middle of the parking lot, almost symbolizing a warning, you know, almost. Just a little bit. If you, if you look closely, you might might miss it. Now, in a typical pro gamer fashion, of course, the main character ignores this and continues walking. You gotta respect him. I mean, he knows what he wants and he's, he's gonna get it. While walking, he runs into several more stop signs, ignoring each one along the way. At the end of the parking lot, the main character finds a weird square tunnel thing with a note inside. The note reads, machines like these ones breaking down are why we switched to the hypno orbs. It's unfortunate the others left without you. Now you're just here here alone. So now we know that this note is likely referring to the glowing orbs in the beginning of this series, and we know that they're called hyp hypna orbs. I, I can't say that correctly without stuttering, so we're, we're just going to call them orbs for the entirety of the series for now, but we, we know what they're called, right? Now the last part is a bit puzzling, at least to me. Assuming that these notes are directed at the main character, which they are as the series will soon reveal, who was it that left them behind? Does this game represent some sort of 
purgatory to him? Or maybe does it represent some type of emotion, a sense of isolation that he somehow feels? The main character doesn't respond to this note. He just walks around observing the machine, and that's where episode three ends. Now in episode four, the main character finds a file in his videos folder on his computer. It appears to be a recording from the developer of the game. This is what happens in that video. So you can see this is some sort of demo or something and it's showing us that there is something here. Now, the main character, if you caught it, he actually states that he uploaded the full version of that video on his channel. This is actually what happens in the full version of that video if you go and actually click on the link in the description. Now, obviously, this version didn't exist when the main character originally played it on his computer. We saw that he watched it all the way towards the end, and the red eyes thing was definitely not there. So this implies that some sort of entity in the game also has control over the main character's channel. This also implies that whatever it is, knows that we're watching. Anyways, uh, from the video, the main character gathered that he must revisit the level and follow the path from the demo tape. So that's exactly what he does, and this is what he found. I don't like this level. There's something very eerie about all of this. But anyways, um, yeah, we have something in front of us. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, it's a little radio. I have one just like this, or, well, it looks a little bit different, but <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's very similar to this. Yeah, okay. All right, well, let's let's turn it on, I guess. Huh. Yeah, hello. So a new character with pink text is introduced, and she goes by radio. The radio seems notably excited by the arrival of the main character, and is eager to help him turn on the machine, like really, really eager to help him turn on the machine. Now it's interesting how the radio mentions supporting other listeners here. This implies that the main character isn't the first person who's been through this. It's actually implied that there's other people in this world, the world of the game. So she doesn't just have an active audience of one here. Now after the dialogue with the radio, the main character returns to the machine. This time it's turned on and he actually walks through. This is what happens when he walks through the machine. Uh, yeah. Oh, what?
Now, if that ain't a machine designed by William Afton, then I don't, I don't know what is. That, that has the energy, does it not? It's, it's not structurally sound. Now, to me, this seems deliberate in all seriousness. Um, I believe that the radio knew that this was going to happen. Her goal was to reset the game after, you know, the, the main character goes through the machine and send him back to the beginning level. So all those error messages, it, it was intentional. The radio knew what she was doing. Now, she doesn't want him to see what happens next in the game, I think. At least this is clearly implied to me through her actions. So that ends episode four. Now we're gonna go ahead and move on to episode five. The main character returns a couple of days later, clearly unsettled by the game at this point. Nevertheless, he opens up the game once more, and once again, he's at the boardwalk. The main character continues to walk forward towards the tower. He is reunited with the radio, and this is how their conversation went. I'm turning the radio on. Yeah, I'm, I'm not gonna do that. I gotta, I gotta figure out what's going on here. I gotta see this thing through. I'm not turning my computer off. Things may get a bit shaky. I'm not entirely sure what that's supposed to mean, but wait, what? Okay. Yep. Sure, that makes sense. Yeah, I can't... <laughs> I can't be surprised. In my opinion, this basically confirms that the machine falling apart was, again, deliberately done by the radio. She's trying to protect the main character for whatever reason. Despite radio's warnings, of course, uh, the main character decides to continue anyways. W wouldn't you do that? Wouldn't you be a deer and just put yourself in bad situations? Wouldn't you just keep doing that? That You would keep doing that, wouldn't you? I, I knew you would do it. The main character continues to walk down the new path that was created. He finds an underwater orb at the end of the path and jumping in takes him to a school level. Now, there he finds a note and this is what the note says. You spent so long in places like this daydreaming. Daydreaming about how hungry you were. But it wasn't just food. It was the hunger for things you can't have. Things you'll never have. Those are the things that make you so fat. Now, the main character says that the note is very mean and, and very not nice. And that's all he says. Now, I gathered something a little bit deeper from that message. So again, uh, whoever wrote it says that the main character was envious or hungry for things that other people had that he didn't have. And of course, they, they made an interesting uh, phrase there. And if you, you pay attention, you'll notice that whoever wrote the note says that the main character wasn't just hungry for food. He was also hungry for what other people had that he didn't have. So he was also not only metaphorically hungry, but he was literally hungry. So this is starting to imply that something a little bit darker might be happening here. Especially since, you know, this is taking him back to what appears to be an elementary school. So why was he hungry as a child and why was he so envious of the other children? We're gonna learn a little bit more about that in a second. After reading the note, the main character finds a cafeteria room at the end of the hallway with only one big table. He finds a note on the table that tells him not to feed the eye in the closet. He talks to the eye and then this happens. All right.
The main character listens despite the note telling him otherwise and gives him the food. Immediately after giving the entity three pieces of food, the eye thing starts to chase him as these three pieces of food simply weren't enough. The main character runs until he finds an escape orb and then he reaches the boardwalk once more. Now, the hungry eye and the note in the school could represent a number of things. Perhaps this means that the main character was jealous somehow of something that his classmates had that he didn't. Whether this was literal food or something else he hasn't mentioned, um, this might have caused him to lash out on his classmates as a result. Hence the note in the cafeteria describing the eye as mean and telling others not to feed it. Now, I will say that often uh, when kids come from a troubling or traumatic background, this can actually cause them to have emotional outbursts more often and it can cause them to take their anger out on other people. Now, not to read into this too, too deeply, but this is definitely something to keep in mind. Now, in episode six, um, we are back at the boardwalk. <laughs> Not getting tired of that at all. Uh, we're back at the boardwalk, fun. Uh, the main character states that he wants to reflect on the things he's witnessed so far. He says that it's all a lot for him to process, and he says that stuff like this doesn't usually affect him. However, somehow this game does exactly that. He mentioned that he recognizes some of the places that he's seen. He says while he doesn't recall seeing these places specifically, he says that he still has a feeling that he's seen them before exactly as they are. Now, this is a point that I will be bringing up again later on in the series. Again, keep that in mind. Now, the main character theorizes that the game was either a virus or a prank, but leans more towards the game being an epic YouTuber prank instead. Yeah, it, it was actually me. Yeah, it was me the whole time. I, I put the game on his computer and I, I want it back, please. Give it. Give it back. Right now. Hand it over. Now, as the main character continues to talk, he mentioned that either he's going crazy or there's a ghost in his computer. Right as he says this, the video cuts to another demo scene. This is how that scene plays out. Now, interestingly, based on the way that this dialogue is worded, the entity here addresses the player in this clip as you and the main character as the player. So they also mention that they are aware of us watching these videos and describe us as enjoying the torment somehow. Now this really brings into question who the person is that's recording these demo clips in the first place. Since the entity definitely addresses them as being a separate person, it would seem that they probably are and they're definitely not the main character. Something to think about. 
The main character states that he needs a break before continuing the game and stresses his continued interests and that he'll continue investigating in future episodes. Episode 7. The main character opens up the game. This time it's raining. He makes his way over to the tower when suddenly this happens. I'm kind of excited to see what we get this time. What? Really? I don't know why this, this part made me giggle, made me chuckle. I, I don't know. I don't have all the answers here, okay? I'm just a little stupid at the end of the day. Maybe I'm just a little dumb. Uh, anyways, our boy is now in ye old back rooms with a few drawings on the walls. One drawing says, beware red eyes, likely mentioning the shadow entity from earlier, and behind one wall, he finds a note. It reads, I know you know this place, liminality in its purest, most stale form. Find all my notes? and maybe you will learn something. I'm sorry. I, it's just the way these notes are, are worded. I can't help myself. Like, I just hear their voice as being like a fucking Disney villain or some shit. <laughs> now, the main character accepts this side quest and continues. He says that he has a history with the back rooms and states that he has a, a love-hate relationship with it, as we all do, and that it actually terrifies him. In the other room, he manages to find the radio again, but there's only static. Next to the radio is a note, and it says the following. Her, I hate her so much. She thinks thinks she can make things perfect and make things happy, but this does not work. It cannot work. A defiler of my work. She should have never been created. Thank God her signals cannot penetrate these walls. I will stop. That, that, okay, it's over now. You made it, you made it through. I'm not using that voice anymore. I hope you're proud of yourself. You managed to make it this far. <laughs> the main character reacts by calling this note rude and he states that the radio is actually nice. He continues exploring and finds another note. It says the following. This place perfectly represents how much of a failure you are. The infinite hallways, buzzing lights, and stains form such a strong connection to you. Our infinite golden spiral of failure, with you at the center, I watch from above. The main character is clearly bothered by this note, but continues into a room filled with office chairs, led by a few arrows on the walls. He hears a phone ringing in the other room, and he, of course he goes to answer it. But before answering, he finds a note, and it reads, Another representation of your failure. You're giving up. When will you learn to just stop? Is it not enough for you to keep failing over and over? Why do you try so hard when so many others do it much better? If this ain't my inner dialogue. If this ain't my inner fucking dialogue. Once again, visibly unnerved by this note, he turns around without answering the phone. So what, you're just not gonna, you're not gonna commit? Go on, answer that phone, buddy. Go on, pick it up. It, it's just me on the other line. I'm just, I'm just giving you a call. But see, this, this is what happens. Every time I call Walmart, no one answers the phone. <laughs> now, after wandering around a bit, he finds another note. Hesitating to read it, he does so anyway. Another dead end. How pitiful. Do you ever think there is a point to your journey? A reason for you being here? Or are you just too much of a goddamn idiot to realize who put you here? You should give up. Again. And yet you cannot, can you? Only you would fail at giving up. Now this is the note that causes the main character to reach his breaking point. I'll let the rest of that moment play out for itself. I'm, I'm just so frustrated. Okay? B because I, I just... I keep coming back, right? I can't stop myself from just continuously playing this game, even when I don't want to. And it's like, for what purpose? All that this game has done is terrify me, belittle me, and make fun of me. And I don't understand it. Like, why do I recognize these places? Why does it all feel so personal? I'm getting sick of it. I'm starting to feel like someone's fucking with me and imagine being so mad that your anger just opens up a gateway into the abyss. Now, now I, I wouldn't know a damn thing about. Now, this is where episode 8 begins. The main character opens up the episode with an apology for his outburst in the last one. I don't forgive you. No, actually, you were very mean to me specifically, so no, no, sorry, sorry. With nowhere else to go, the main character walks into the darkness. The main character begins by searching the perimeter of the back room's map, but when he makes it to the other side, the lights are out. The main character begrudgingly goes back in in search of more answers. When he turns to the radio, he sees that he has the option 
option to pick it up. The main character picks up the radio and decides to take it outside since the note from earlier said that the back rooms cut off her signal. After taking the radio outside, the radio greets the main character. She expresses how much she dislikes the back rooms due to them cutting off her signal. She then proceeds to help the main character find a way out. The radio then instructs the main character to walk opposite the building until he finds a teleporter. While walking, the radio states that the entity writing the notes must have been mean to him earlier. They apologize, stating that they can be really rude sometimes, yeah you think? The radio says that they're not supposed to talk too much about it. In fact, they don't think that Red Eyes wants them talking about it at all. Nevertheless, she says she'll help the main character through it. She says that Red Eyes is mean, but he doesn't have to listen to him. So this kind of confirms that Red Eyes, or the entity that was shown in prior clips, is the one who's writing the notes. I mean, who else would write the notes other than a motherfucker that, that looks like this? The main character finally arrives. They find a spiral stair staircase and a pyramid, and strangely, they find a weird box, leg Lego box thing, that the radio explains is a key slot. Um, the radio instructs him to find three keys to open the pyramid. After finding the first key, the main character climbs the staircase in search for the rest. And then once he does this, the radio gives him an honestly very heartwarming pep talk. Have a listen. <laughs> At the end of the path, the main character finds the third key and jumps back down to the key box. After placing the keys into the box, the pyramid opens and he makes his way inside. This is where episode 9 begins. After walking inside the orb, we get a warning message and we see daylight with birds chirping in the background. The next scene is of the main character, presumably since they have the exact same voice, on the boardwalk map from before. This time, however, they describe the game as something they've been working working on this entire time. He says he wants to upload his dev logs to YouTube even though no one will be watching. He describes the first level as a prototype, further stating that he's not sure what the tower is going to be for. Now this explains why the main character was kind of remembering some of these levels from the game earlier. It wasn't just a sense of nostalgia due to having been in some familiar places in the past. He made this game himself, which is exactly why he remembers these specific levels. But the question is, how come he doesn't remember? Moving on, the main character proceeds to show us the rest of the levels from his game, again stating that he made all of it. He's essentially touring all these levels throughout the whole video, discussing the inspiration behind each and his goals for the development of the game. When he reaches the school level, he states it's based on a school he went to as a kid. Some great memories, some not. Interestingly, each level we see that it's actually the daytime, contrary to what we saw earlier, which had the levels at nighttime. At the end of the video, he returns to the tower. Interestingly though, in front of the tower, he runs into to a radio. The main character expresses confusion, having never added the radio to the game before. Upon further inspection, the main character realizes that this is actually his radio from real life. And then the video cuts. After the video cuts, this happens.
Now, through this episode, we learn that the main character is the same person who made this game. But for some reason, he's lost all recollection of this. We also learn that Red Eyes and Radio are both sentient entities that have somehow infiltrated the main character's game without him realizing it. Now, in that clip at the very end, when Red Eyes and Radio were arguing, Radio begs Red Eyes to let the player go. So it seems like Red Eyes might have some sort of supernatural power that can reach beyond the barrier of the game and into real life, making it impossible for the main character to ever truly leave the game. Maybe Red Eyes is the one who's been wiping his memory the whole time. We return back to where we left off, when the main character was about to enter the orb. Suddenly, Radio stops the main character from entering the orb. She tells the main character that he needs a fourth key. The main character is shocked that he missed the fourth key, but listens to Radio anyway. Alright, if there's no other interruptions, I'm gonna go inside now, okay? So, let's do it. Cool. We're back. If you guys remember from episode 8, this is not how things went down at all. In that episode, the main character actually makes it to the orb right before the video cuts. So this could actually be the mistake that Red Eyes told Radio to fix earlier. The main character wasn't supposed to enter the orb without getting the fourth key. Because earlier, when he actually did enter the orb without the key, it caused him to time travel back to the very beginning when he was first developing the game. So essentially, this kind of wiped his memory of all the weird things that he's witnessed so far. So this implies that somehow, Radio and Red Eyes have complete control over the decisions that the main character makes, and they also have complete control over his timeline. Now in episode 10, the main character states that the rain feels heavier than it did last time. He starts running down the path once more when Radio speaks to him. She expresses how happy he is that he made it. She says that things get complicated there. What? Are you, are you saying that my guy's dumb? Are you saying he's he's a little bit of a doofus? So you, is that what you think? You think you gotta, you gotta hold his hand through this whole thing? At the end, the main character finds another note on the tower. It says the following. This is your wake up call, but you will not listen to it. You never have, and you never will. The main character sets down the other path next to the tower. At some point, the main character gets another message from radio. She asks what his favorite color is. After realizing he can't respond, she says, well, for me, I can never choose between pink or purple. It's like, pink is awesome, I love it, but purple is sort of of like pink, just different. How can I expect to choose? Most of the time I love pink, but I just love purple so much. We, we love an androgynous queen. We love it. Go, go get it, sister. Suddenly she remembers there's something she needs to go take care of and signs off. As the main character keeps walking, he realizes the towers keep repeating. At some point while walking, a new character intercepts the radio. This is how that interaction went. Okay. An electron in the field. Here, when the laws of physics deem it to be most convenient. Now, the green text character says that him and the main character are one and the same. Perhaps this is a piece of symbolism that I'm not quite understanding. It just kind of kind of breezed over my head, you know, like a tub of butter. You know, like when, when one rubs butter into their scalp. It just kind of went right over my head, just just, just like that. See, you, you know what I mean. So if you guys have any suggestions on what the symbolism is here, feel free to suggest something in the comment section below, because this is something that I just wasn't quite able to figure out. At the end of the path, the main character finds an island. And I swear to God, I have seen this exact same island in a dream that I had when I was like 14. I don't fucking know why. Maybe it's because it's the most generic looking copy and paste island ever, but let let me have my moment, okay? Let me have my, my bra moment. Anyways, when he explores the island, he finds an entrance leading to the inside, to which Radio says, oh no. Oh no? 
Well, I say, oh yes. Funny how she couldn't say this over the radio though. Like it, it's almost like something was stopping her from warning the main character. Once again, another stop sign can be seen at the front of the entrance. So at this point, I think it's kind of implied that the radio is the person or the entity that was leaving all these stop signs. So she's she's one of us, she's with us, okay? She's on our side. And for whatever reason, she, she, she gets it. She doesn't want the main character to keep going because she knows that it's not within his best interests. But again, like a true um, Reddit hero, uh, the main character ignores the stop sign and continues anyway. He finds an elevator inside the island, and we all know what that means. He starts to descend. Radio tries talking to the main character, presumably to warn him, but the words are censored, again, implying that something is silencing her. As the elevator continues to descend, it gets faster until it crashes. Everything is broken, including the radio. Now the main character is alone underground. With nowhere else to go, the main character proceeds down the dark tunnel. As he goes deeper, he finds extremely messed up stuff. Now, if anyone here is sensitive to the topic that you see on screen here, um, go ahead and skip to the timestamp that you see on your screen. And I promise, this time I got the timestamps right. I know I messed up in my previous video, I'm, I'm deeply sorry about that, but this timestamp is correct, I double checked it, so Skip right here if you're uncomfortable with this subject. Okay, now with that warning out of the way, I'm gonna go ahead and play this clip out here. Oh, there's a note. Golly gee, can't wait to read it. Right? I mean, that's... That's kind of... Oh. <clears throat> All right. Now, after making this disturbing discovery, the main character seems quite visibly, well, disturbed, as one would be. He continues anyway. Suddenly, he hears a phone ringing. Will he answer it this time, ladies and gentlemen? Do, do you think he will answer it? Oh, he does. And it's, it's not good. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, play that clip out here. me alone. I, I just want to be left alone. Okay? Just leave. Just, just leave me alone! 
Now we know a little bit more about what's going on here. The Red Eyes character is a manifestation, at least in my opinion, of the main character's guilt. And he's trying to force him to relive this traumatic past experience regarding a relative over and over again. Now in episode 12, this episode starts off with a few developer photos from the game. The words beginnings of something awful appear on the screen. Now in my opinion, these, the coloring of these words, it looks a little bit similar to both the words that we saw in the telephone call and also the electron in the field character. Now if I were to guess, this could either be the electron character talking or this could be a representation of the main character inner dialogue, I, I'm really not too sure yet. Now, each photo seems to be taken inside of a brick building. It then cuts to developer footage. Now, the person controlling the player walks up to a note on the wall. It's blank. He turns around to see a table. The video cuts back to an image of the table. The words, creations of hate, not love, appear on the screen. We get shown more photos from the inside of the brick building. We then see another video of the player walking up to a blank note on the wall. Now, the the player turns back to the table and walks past it down the hallway. Now, they walk up to another wall with a note on it, right behind several pillars resembling the tower from the boardwalk map. Now, that that this part's a little concerning to me. So, it almost looks like this level represents a sort of prison of sorts, and the pillars being in that alignment, they almost look like the bars on a cage. I don't know if this is supposed to represent a past memory for the main character, but if it does, then I'm starting to become a little bit more concerned for obvious reasons. Now, of course, after checking the note behind the tower thingies, we find that the note is blank once more. The player turns back and walks down a hallway, abruptly stops and keeps keeps walking. Now the radio is on the table in this clip. Uh, the player interacts with the radio. Now Red Eye speaks to the radio, so we, we now learn that whoever's controlling this player is actually Red Eyes. They say, why do you keep sending your radios here? Now after asking that question, Radio speaks, saying, I just wanted to hear what you were up to. Clearly she's trying to supervise Red Eyes here, while trying not to be too direct about it at the same time, almost like she's kind of walking on eggshells around them a little bit. It's it's quite quite a weird dynamic that they have. So Red Eyes replies, stating, you are a distraction from my work. Radio says, no need to be so rude, Red. I like what you're making here. It could use some work though, Red Eyes says. What? Radio explains. Well, first of all, it kind of feels familiar. Red Eyes is silent. Radio says that the bricks look too samey and that red should make them a different color. Radio suggests making them green instead. I'm sorry, Radio. I, I was on your side up until you said green. Who the fuck in their right mind would want a green brick basement? Listen, if I'm gonna be locked up in a serial killer's basement, I, I at least want it to be something like purple or, or red or orange or something that that would at least make the experience more tolerable for me but but green what are you out of your mind radio you're, you're you're just clueless come on now red replies green i do not want your fucking feedback go off you should not be here you are a distraction and nothing else i've removed you and you keep coming back this is the final time. Radio states, you can't just ignore me forever. Red backs up after hearing this. We get shown an image of one of the rooms with a red pyramid thingy. The green text at the bottom reads, you should listen to her. Again, we're shown another picture before the video cuts to Red exploring the pyramid thing. They look at another blank note on the wall. They walk down the hallway again to find the radio on the table. This is what happens. I, I don't know why I found this part so viscerally funny. I, I don't know. I truly think that there's something wrong with me. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry. It, it's just, hold on. 
Let me get a Pringles can so I can recreate this for you guys, an accurate demonstration of what happened. Okay, he literally took the radio and he just went. Well, that's a workout there, that'll, that, that'll get you sweating. They have, they have a moment. Okay, and then, and then the video just cuts, that's it. And we're left on a cliffhanger right there, guys. That, that's where the series ends. <laughs> okay, so here are my final thoughts on the series so far. Now, personally, I feel like there are actually many layers to the actual meaning of this story. Immediately, one of the first main themes that stood out to me were the parallels being drawn towards mental illness. Uh, judging by the notes left by Red Eyes, they definitely seem to represent the voice of depression, anxiety, anxiety, and possibly PTSD. Now just to preface this, in case anyone didn't know, I'm not a doctor. I'm just kind of speaking from personal experience as someone who also struggles with these conditions. Just a little thought nugget for you guys to snack on for later. I also believe that radio kind of represents the voice of reason for the main character, if, if that makes sense. Now she seems to counter everything that Red Eyes says, no matter how much they may try to silence her. So I think this might, again, this could represent the main character's um, intrusive thoughts, just kind of kind of duking it out in his head in his head there. So now in episode nine, we do get a pretty significant twist in the story. We discover that the main character is actually the creator of the game, but for some reason he has no recollection of it. And it's revealed through dialogue between Red Eyes and the radio that this was intentionally done by radio to mess up Red Eyes's. Plan. So this basically shows that radio and potentially red eyes have total control over the current reality that the main character is living in. And they've somehow got him caught in this sort of loop where they just keep wiping his memory and sending him back to the game. Now based on this evil plan that um, Red Eyes keeps mentioning, I believe that there's something that the main character either needs to realize or do in order to break out of the loop. But it's not clear what it is yet. And for now, the main character is just caught in this purgatory of guilt and he keeps having to relive his past regrets as a result. Now, I also believe that this isn't just about some guy who feels guilt over his dad passing, which was implied through the telephone call in episode 11. I feel like there could be more to this story that the main character is not willing to reveal right now. But as mentioned previously, I think that there could be elements of childhood trauma at play here. Now, specifically, I think that this gets hinted at during episode five when the main character appears in the school. We know that this is based off of the school that he went to as a kid, and he explains this later on, of course, in episode nine. Now, the note left by Red Eyes in this level is very interesting to me. They basically said that the main character was hungry for something that they didn't have, as well as actual food, something else that they didn't have. So they were jealous, but of what? Now this could either represent, again, a literal lack of food due to childhood neglect, or a lack of something much deeper. Was it a lack of parental love? We, we don't really know. Either way, having feelings like this so early on in life, and having them so strongly, makes me think that there might have been some form of neglect or abuse taking place in the main character's life. Which could also explain why he remembers so little about the school even when he first starts exploring that level. This would also explain the symbolism of the hungry eye in the closet and the note in a child's handwriting stating that he's mean. This could seem to indicate that the main character might have been lashing out to some capacity around his classmates as a result, again, of said dysfunctional childhood. All in all, I think that the layers to this story run really deep and inevitably we'll probably get to see what the real story behind the main character's predicament is. Now I'm gonna end this story off on this note for now and I'll leave it up to you guys to figure out the rest. Thanks for watching.